If uh, you spend any time reading biographies of Christian people, uh, preachers or saints of other kinds, missionaries and stuff, there's something that you'll very frequently find in these bio biographies. They, they will point to some experience that they had that was so profound that it made them realize that God was there, and it is so sacred that they can barely talk about it. And we're going to get to look at one of those occasions today, I think. This is a pivotal event in the life of Jacob. It's when he stops talking about the God of his grandfather Abraham and his father Isaac, and now he starts talking about his God. This becomes personal. This is a transition period. This is somewhat of a head-scratcher for a number of things, but the text actually starts off with saying that the first thing that happens is Jacob saw some angels. Angels of God came to meet him. When Jacob saw them, he exclaimed, this is God's camp, and he named it Mahanaim. What's that about? I don't know. I assume the angels were there to strengthen him because he knew that this was a tough thing. Jacob was going back to confront his brother, who he had ripped off earlier and treated shamefully. The last time they met, you remember, Esau was saying, I am going to kill him as soon as dad dies. So Jacob's got a little reason to be a little bit nervous. So I think what we see here are almost like three different Jacobs. At the beginning, we see a, um, I think it's a guilt-ridden Jacob, that as he thinks about all the things he's done, he feels this sense of uh, remorse, this sense of repentance, I believe. The second is the repentant Jacob, which is why I think he felt repentant. And what he's going to do here is he's going to, to try to show Esau that he's not the monster that he thought he was. And then at the end, we see Jacob the wrestler, which is an interesting story in and of itself. I think what happens here is that Jacob realizes that what he did was wrong. So he sends messengers to Esau because, well, maybe he thought in his head, it's better if Esau hears it from me. And the message comes back and says, oh, the good news is your brother's coming to see you. You don't have to come to see him. The troubling news is he's bringing 400 warriors with him. Now, if you're Jacob, what would you assume? He assumes, we're going to find out next week incorrectly, that his brother is coming to kill him, to kill everything that he's got. So the first thing Jacob does, as is his custom, he schemes. He tries to come up with a plan. So he gets all his animals together. But, but notice this. This is, this is an amazing thing. Do you remember um, last time we talked about how uh, he was blessed in the time of Laban? And you look at some of the gifts that he gives here. It's just astounding. But his first instinct is to panic. Verses 7 and 8. Jacob was terrified at the news. He divided his household along with the flocks and herds and camels into two groups. He thought... Here's a positive mental attitude here. If Esau meets one group and attacks it, perhaps the other group can escape. But then we see a change in Jacob. Now he changes, and he moves from schemes to prayer. Maybe he's learned something. Maybe he's learning something here. So Jacob prays, O God of my grandfather Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, you told me return to your own land and to your relatives. Is he blaming God at the beginning of this? I don't know. And you promised me I will treat you kindly. And then we see a change in his attitude here, don't we? I'm not worthy of all the unfailing love and faithfulness you've shown to me, your servant. When I left home and crossed the Jordan River, I owned nothing except a walking stick. Now my household fills two large camps. Oh, Lord, please rescue me from the hand of my brother Esau. I'm afraid that he's coming to attack me along with my wives and children. But you promised me I will surely treat you kindly and I will multiply your descendants until they become as numerous as the sands along the seashore, too many to count. So 
the first thing he does is he appeals to God's promise. And you know, that's a good place to start. Go back and look at what the Word of God has told you and cling to it. The second thing he does is he adopts a posture of humility and gratitude. Isn't that a good way to approach God in prayer, especially in the tough times? Instead of coming in and telling God what he should do, we come in there recognizing that God has been faithful in the past. And I think that's where Jacob is now. He's saying, you know, Lord, you, you've done so much for me. I, I left with nothing. And for 14 years, I worked hard. And though I'm grateful for my two wives, that's all I got out of it. And the last six years must have been really good years when we read what comes next. And, and he's grateful to God. And this is where this remorse that he's, that he's felt about what he did to his brother is now changing. And he's beginning to feel this sense of, I owe you, God. I need to start living my life in a, in a much better way. And that leads us to repentance, Jacob. Now, I love this, that uh, he tells us what he sends as a gift. Again, remember, he starts out with nothing, right? He just said that. I started with nothing. And this is the gift that he gives to his brother. 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams, 30 female camels with their young, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, and 10 male donkeys. Well, he must have had one heck of a herd, didn't he? This is the gift. This is just a portion of what he was given. And he div divides the animals into herds and assigns to each different servant. Now, some people will say that what he's doing here is trying to buy off his brother. Maybe. Verse 20, though, it says, Be sure to say, look, your servant Jacob is right behind us. And Jacob thought, I will try to appease him by sending gifts ahead of me. When I see him in person, perhaps he will be friendly to me. Now what's interesting is if you look at different translations, they have different words for perhaps you'll be friendly to me. The, the NIV, I believe, says perhaps he will forgive me. Isn't that interesting? So now it appears that Jacob was sending these gifts as a way of saying, look, I'm sorry. What I did was wrong. Please accept these gifts as my, as my apology. And this is what real repentance is. Worldly sorrow doesn't have this. Over in 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul talks about worldly sorrow and genuine repentance. And he had sent the Corinthians this really hard letter, uh, kind of taking them to task, bawling them out a little bit. And now he writes in verse 8, I am not sorry that I sent this severe letter to you, though I was sorry at first, for I knew it was painful to you for a little while. Now I am glad I sent it, not because it hurt you, but because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. Repent and change your ways really are, are go together because you can't have one without the other. It was the kind of sorrow God wants his people to have. So you were not harmed by us in any way, for the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow, but worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. So worldly sorrow, the kind of sorrow that we see a lot of people engage in, is they say, well, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But that's it. And the truth is, all they're really doing is trying to escape consequences. That's not the same thing as repentance. Repentance is coming back and saying, I know I hurt you. And I'm sorry. And if there's something I can do to make this up to you, I will. And I will try to go in a different direction. Repentance is an effort to restore relationships. Repentance is expressing your sorrow and beginning a process of changing. So saying you're sorry and continuing to do the same thing shows that you haven't repented at all. It appears that Jacob has repented. 
Now, this is really important for us when it comes to our salvation. Because the Bible tells us that we need to come to Him and admit our sin. So we're supposed to come with a repentant attitude. And what that really means is it's not a matter of coming to God and saying, hey, God, I'm in trouble. I really want to go to heaven when I die. So I accept Jesus. I believe He died for me. Yada, yada. Amen. And we say, I said the prayer. I'm in. No, no. He's asking us to come with the right attitude. So we come to the Lord and we say, Lord, I, my life is a mess. And I've messed everything up, and there is nothing that I know to do to fix it. And so I come to you as the only one who can pay for my sin. And, and Lord, I'm sorry, and, and I give you my life. I give you everything I've got, and I ask you to come inside of me and make me a different person. That's the repentant attitude. That's the person who really understands what the gospel's about. And so that's why this is important for us because we don't want a spurious salvation. We want the true salvation. Now, we get to this interesting account where, and, and we, we notice here that Jacob, you know, he takes everybody else across the river and he sounds, he looks a little cowardly here, doesn't he? Okay, all you guys go ahead of me and uh, if, you guys, if you guys all survive, I guess I'll deal with my brother. And then he comes back across the river. So he's all by himself. And then we read this. This left Jacob all alone in the camp, and a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. When the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of its socket. Then the man said, let me go, for the dawn's breaking. Jacob said, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. What is your name? The man asked. He replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. From now on, you'll be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Please tell me your name, Jacob said. Why do you want to know my name, the man replied. Then he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named the place Peniel, which means face of God. And he moves on. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. And he went away limping. The spotlight here, the one that, that really troubles us, is verse 28. From now on you will be called Israel because you have fought with God and men and have won? A person fought with God and men and won? Over in the book of Hosea, this is mentioned in um, the prophet. He writes, even in the womb, Jacob struggled with his brother. When he became a man, he even fought with God. Yes, he wrestled with the angel. Okay, now, now we're getting some insight here. And won. How does that happen? He wept and pleaded for a blessing from him. There at Bethel, he met God face to face, and God spoke to him. I find this to be an odd passage. Well, there's, there's a number of things that are here. The first is, who is this person who wrestled with Jacob? And, and I want you to notice something. It does not say, it, this person, whoever it is, and we think it's an angel, I think it's an angel, this person picks the fight. A man came up and wrestled with him until dawn. Jacob doesn't pick the fight. This being, this angel comes and picks a fight. So we say, why? Why? What's the purpose? Well, I've got a suggestion. I think what was happening here is that Jacob needed to learn that over the course of his life, he was not fighting his brother. He was not fighting Laban. His, his fight all along was with God. You know, that's a good thing for us to remember when we see people who are uh, cantankerous and um, antagonistic towards us. A lot of times, it's not us that they're mad at. They've got a problem with God, and they need to solve that problem. And that's what's going on here. I think he's trying to let him know that, that you are fighting me. And I believe that this whole win thing, which really troubles me, I, how do you fight with God and win? I think we're looking at win the wrong way. 
I believe what needed to happen here was that Jacob needed to reach the end of his strength and cry out to God to reach the end of his rope, if you will, and then to hang on tenaciously to the Lord because that's not what he's done in the past. He's always come up with his own schemes in the past. Now he clings to the Lord. I will not let you go unless you bless me even though I am exhausted. And in that sense, in that sense, he finally won. He won because he learned that his strength is in the Lord. It's kind of like when Paul talks about the thorn in the flesh. He says, three times I prayed, Lord, deliver me. And he found out that the Lord said to him, your, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. When, Paul says, when I am weak, then I am strong. I've learned to depend upon the Lord. And I think this is where the winning comes in. So now this relationship becomes personal. Now here's where I really think it shows us that this is not about him winning the wrestling match. He goes all night, and when he wants to leave, what does he do? Touches his hip and it dislocates it. That says to me, this guy could have won at any time he wanted. Any moment he could have disabled Jacob and the, and the match would have been over. So it wasn't about winning the wrestling match. It was about his spirit. It was about learning what he needed to learn before he ever met his brother Esau. Then there's that question of, why did he ask him for his name? Didn't you know who you came to wrestle with? I mean, think about it. You're an angel. You come and pick a fight with a guy, and you don't even know who he is? That's not the case. A couple things here. Number one, the last time we read about somebody asking Jacob for his name, it was his dad. And what did he say? He didn't say, I'm Jacob. He said, I'm Esau. He lied. The name Jacob means deceiver. I think there's a sense here in which the angel is saying, you need to come to grips with who you are. You need to stop pretending to be somebody that you're not. Jacob, if we're going to have a relationship, we've got to be honest with each other. I ran across a great quote from a guy by the name of John Corson, who's a commentator. He writes this, Jacob, a can-do kind of guy, was clever, charming, skilled, intelligent, a man any smart CEO would want to hire. God, on the other hand, said, I have big plans for you, Jacob. You're going to have a huge impact on the history of the world. For from you will come an entire nation, and from that nation will come Messiah. I have big plans for you, but you're too smart, too self-confident, too clever. Therefore, I'm going to break you. Dear sister and brother, you must understand that no matter how charming or intelligent or clever you are, or how good you may be in any given area, your skill is puny your intelligence is nothing. Your strength is scrawny in comparison to God's. So God says, I'm going to allow this pain in your life because then and only then will you lean on me every step of the way, knowing that if you don't, you'll fall flat on your face. And as you lean on me, you'll draw strength from me and you'll be governed by me instead of trying to make things happen on your own. Isn't that good? Who knew that there was that kind of an application here for us? So now that he knows his name, why does he change it? You know, that's what happens throughout the Bible, that when, when a person has an encounter with God, when they've changed who they are, God often changes their name. He changed Abram to Abraham. He changes Jacob to Israel. He changed um, Saul to Paul. He changed Peter from Simon to Peter. And he changes our name when we come to him. From sinner to saint. From enemy to friend. From lost to redeemed. We become children of God. And then there's this whole hip thing. Poor guy tendon gets strained, he's limping, 
And we say, what was the purpose of that? The scars of life remind us of the battles that we fought and won. Can you imagine now that whole way going to see his brother? <laughs> you know, he's limping. And every step he's reminded that his strength is not in his schemes. It's in his God. <sighs> That's fantastic. And what we're going to see next week is that this guy's whole approach changes because of his relationship with God. Through our scars, we reveal our faithfulness. It's actually our testimony, isn't it? When others see us limp, they realize that our faith has been tested in the fire. When they see us limp, they understand that we've truly lived with faith. Let me conclude this way. Unfortunately, many of us are more like Jacob than we want to admit. We spend our lives wishing we were somebody else. Perhaps we wish we were the firstborn or had the looks or personality that somebody else has. Or maybe we wish we were in a different family or a different age or even a different gender. Some people are so fixed on this that they will dress like other people, they will get their hair cut like certain people, they will talk like certain people because they really want to be somebody other than who they really are. And unfortunately, the only thing that happens is you forget your name. God called each of us to be someone unique. He wants you to be you. But to get there, you have to stop pretending. You've stop, got to stop pretending you have it all together. You've got to stop pretending that you can do this on your own. You've got to stop pretending that, that you don't have any problems in your life. You've got to stop pretending to be someone else. We, like Jacob, need to reach the end of ourselves so that we can cling to him. Like Jacob, we must get to that point where we feel true sorrow for our brokenness and our foolishness. We need to demonstrate true repentance and cling tenaciously to the Lord. We come to Jesus to ask him to make us new. We need to welcome this special place of pain because those moments in the depths of pain where you encounter the Lord are not moments that you look back on with scorn. They become treasures where you have found that he was absolutely faithful in the toughest times of your life. And yes, we may come out of the encounter with some bruises and scars and maybe even a limp. But we don't have to hide those things the reminders of God's grace. And the wounds, those wounds, many of those remind us of when we have met God in that very, very, very special way and where we have come to profoundly love Him and trust Him completely. And you know, you may not even be able to talk about those holy times. I've had some of them. And I know what that's like. You can't talk about it. It was so profound. And so we may limp, but every step we take will be a reminder of just how near and precious God really is. So let's pray. Father, I believe that there's probably people here today who are wrestling with you, who are trying to prove their worth to you, who are playing a game, trying to be somebody that they're not. Or maybe that person's us. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to reach the end of our strength and then to hold on so that we might discover just how incredibly faithful you are. And Lord, please help us to own up to our name, to our strengths, our weaknesses our gifts, our liabilities. And Lord, grant that we might trust you to use us as unique individuals to accomplish your purpose. Thank you for always being near. Thank you for being willing to wrestle with us on occasion 
so that we might grow. Amen. We're going to conclude today by singing a great old hymn.